Again, welcome all, and thank you for joining us tonight. I am Sylvia Holt Rabb, Acting Director for the City of Austin's Economic Development Department. Most of you know that the Cultural Arts Division has been working on reimagining the cultural funding programs funded by the hotel occupancy tax for the past two years in consultation with MJR partners and in collaboration with you, the community. Much has happened in this time and it has been pre pre presented in unprecedented challenges and opportunities for us to tackle together. Our equity lens has helped us to see our work differently and to offer new approaches to how we can create a more equitable investment of city funds to build, stabilize, and grow our local cultural sector into the future. The hotel occupancy tax funds are one part of this work, and I hope you will continue to contribute ideas and dialogue to our shared vision for the future. I'll now turn it over to Megan Wells, Cultural Arts Division Manager. Thank you, Silnovia. And Peggy, could you start my video, please? Sure thing. Okay, well, while we're working on that, I apologize. Maybe I'll come on and see y'all in, in a minute. But I just wanted to uh, talk a little about where we are today. We are still in phase four, which is the feedback phase of the cultural funding review. We're nearing the finish line to launch two new proposed programs for FY22. This session is an overview and in it, we will cover a review of our equity commitments to doing this work, a summary of work that has been done up until now, some of the givens we are working with. Great, oh, there I am, great, hello. An overview of the Nexus pilot program, an overview of the Thrive program, a brief mention of third-party administration, a tentative timeline going into next year, and information on next steps, where and how to share your additional feedback. One note to keep in mind as we go through this presentation tonight, we know that everyone is hurting right now. We know that, we hear it, we feel it, we are with you, we are partners with you. The pandemic has hit us all hard and we realize that there is a deep need for immediate relief right now. We as a city and as a department are working on various sources just for that need as well, but we're, but for purposes of this presentation tonight, we are making a distinction between the need for immediate relief and the need for future community sustainability and inclusive investment through our hotel occupancy tax. Our discussion tonight will deal with the latter, the long-term vision for this funding. Other EDD and city programs are being designed to offer the former, the shorter term relief. I hope many of you who are eligible applied for the recent $2 million in arts and culture nonprofit relief grant funds, which was the first American Rescue Plan Act funding that the city has rolled out. There will be additional conversations soon about the remaining $10 million of support identified by city council through ARPA that is to come. Next slide. The city's strategic direction 2023 states that to advance equitable outcomes, the city must lead with a lens of racial equity and healing. Race is the primary predictor of outcomes and it's time to recognize, understand and address racism at its various levels, personal, institutional, structural and systemic. I thought this visual borrowed from createequity.com clearly illustrates the various ways we have been looking at our work in this process through the cultural equity lens. Not only does it emphasize diversity as a foundational tenet of all organizations in the ecosystem, 
But perhaps on a deeper, deeper level, it also calls out the importance of examining the role of large budget organizations to support artists of color within their mission and goals, the systemic redistribution of resources that is needed, and the agency that this new structure could and should support for a greater degree of self-determination for our communities of color. Next slide. The need for racial equity centers centered shift, this, this racial equity centered shift in the cultural arts division's funding programs is clearly illustrated through our own program data. Data gathered from the past and current contracts shows a clear disparity in the distribution of funds between demographic groups. Even in FY21, with the creation of the Equitable Economic Resiliency Framework, Black cultural contractors account for only 9% of total dollars awarded and other BIPOC contractors account for only 28%. White identifying cultural contractors account for the majority of funds awarded at 63%. It is data like this that reveals how our cultural funding system has been exclusionary over time. Next slide. The programs we plan to walk through today are a result of two years of work, which is summarized on this slide. The first column shows the five stages of the cultural funding review. The second column shows the ways in which we involve the public and various advising teams in our process. And the third column shows how the feedback we received in each phase supported the planning in the next phase. There's a lot of text on this slide and I won't read it all out, but I encourage you to use it as a reference later if need be. We remain in phase four today and we will collect feedback through virtual office, office hours, a feedback survey that is available on our webpage and one-on-one -on -one communications with us, us as staff. The feedback we gather through the month of August will inform where we go with a revision of our guidelines that we hope to release in late September, early October. For more information on the cultural review process and to read the interim report released in June, visit the cultural funding review webpage. I'd like to now pass this over to Penny to do our first mentee survey related to public participation. Thank you, Megan. Please answer the following question by inputting your answer directly into mentee. As a reminder, the participation website and unique digital code are located at the top of this slide. How have you participated in the cultural funding review in the past two years? This could include attending workshops, attending open office hours, participating in listening sessions, speaking with staff, sending comments through our comment box, speaking at arts commission meetings or other. We'll allow a few seconds for your response. We're gonna allow just a few more seconds to allow people to continue to respond. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone for your responses. I will now hand it back to Megan Wells to continue our presentation. Thanks, Penny. We started this process in 2019 when there was already pressure on our hot funds to, to support our existing funding framework. Due to the intensification of the pandemic's impact on this source of funds, we were forced to adjust to a very different financial picture. In FY21, we contended with a 46% reduction in what was available compared to the previous year. And projections for FY22 showed a deficit in hotel occupancy tax funding that was caused in part by using a projection model to fund FY21. The projection model has always been tricky for us because our budget is based on an educated guess of where we think those funds will be received. We are now working towards implementing an accrual model which will allow us to shift to use actuals of actual received funds instead of projections over the next two years. We've received support from the Arts Commission for this shift. 
The red portion on this slide shows a one-time contribution from the city's budget reserve stabilization fund that is being put forward by the city manager to fill the hot fund deficit incurred this past year. If approved by council, it will mean that we can begin FY22 without having to put future hot funding towards this deficit. That said, the amount available for FY22 with this shift to accruals is $3 million, which is 75% less than what was available pre-pandemic. With $3 million, we have enough funds to pilot two funding programs, Nexus and Thrive. Hot revenue likely will not stabilize we, until FY25 based on projections, which means we will look to launch Elevate, our third proposed program, once hot fund revenue has increased enough to support a third funding program. Next slide. Here are the givens that we are working with. We know the amount of funding available. The only available money that we will use to fill our pot of funds for FY21 has been determined. The 3 million is the available for FY22. This is all the funding that CAD expects to expend for FY22. We are leading with racial equity. In FY22, we are launching two programs that best answer the equity needs that were exacerbated by the pandemic. Elevate will launch when funding allows. Our investment is future looking. We will use hot funds to invest in a stronger, more racially diverse and inclusive cultural tourism ecosystem. We are moving from projection to, of accrual to, projection to accrual of hot funds. FY23 will be the first year using actual funds accrued. This will mean less uncertainty in planning for program administrators as well as for applicants. It will also mean there can be a shorter window between application closing and entering into contracts. Rules attached to the funding source, hotel occupancy taxes still apply. The overall program designs and structures are refined. We are refining these programs, not starting from scratch. We cannot serve everyone with these programs. In the past, we funded 99% of applications. This was untenable as demand increased every year and the amount of available dollars did not grow proportionately. Feedback from applicants and, and from staff voiced a need for a more rigorous application process, requesting that we hold applicants to a higher standard and that we better align the application approval process to city goals. The scaling back of the number of funded applicants was imminent even before the pandemic hit. We do realize the ecosystem needs all of its members to be sustained. And that is the ultimate goal for us as a community to work toward achieving. I'd now like to hand it over to Sarah Corcoran to discuss program recommendations going forward. Thank you, Megan. Hello, I'm Cultural Funding Specialist Sarah Corcoran. We will now take a closer look at fiscal year 22 pilot programs, Nexus and Thrive. First, delving into the ways in which the recommendations from MJR partners informed these programs, followed by a review of the shared elements that unite them, and then a deeper dive into the guidelines and scoring rubrics for each program. Next slide, please. On October 7th, 2020, MJR partners shared recommendations for a more equitable path forward in our cultural funding programs. These recommendations were based on the many community engagements, listening sessions, workshops, and town halls that were part of the cultural funding review process. These strategies, including the ones not listed here, have been the guiding force in every stage of the program and guidelines design process. A full summary of MJR's recommendations can be found on pages 15 through 20 of the cultural funding inter review interim report located on our website. The recommendations were grouped I'm sorry, the recommendations were grouped into three key categories. One, invest in the creative sector to nurture and protect the artistic expression of Austin's racially and culturally diverse communities. Two, build upon Austin's existing infrastructure. And three, operationalize a policy 
a policy-based plan to redistribute cultural financial resources. MJR then focused, I apologize. I'm gonna to have to hand off to a colleague. I can take that, Sarah. Um, I will have to take a moment to find my place in the script. Um, but yes, in the chat, there is a link to the full interim report. If you want to review pages 15 through 20 um, for a summary of those recommendations that these programs are built around. Uh, next slide. So we wanna make sure that you're aware of some important shared elements in the guidelines for Nexus and Thrive. The first is that leading with racial equity is a core value for all of these and all of CAD's programs. This value is reflected through all phases of the program and guidelines design, especially the funding priorities and scoring rubrics. Compliance with the hotel occupancy tax statute remains an important requirement for both programs. Nexus must fund activities that are marketed and accessible to Austin's tourists, while Thrive must fund art, arts organizations that produce activities that are marketed and accessible to our city's tourists. Geographic eligibility is also a shared element of both programs. All applicants must be located within the Austin Metropolitan Statistical Area, and the majority of the applicants work and any funded activities must occur within the Austin 10 to 1 district or ETJ, extraterritorial jurisdiction. As you read the guidelines, you'll notice that both programs follow simplified payment schedules. While percentages will differ between programs, payment schedules will include two disbursements of funds, a portion upon the execution of your contract and a final payment upon approval of the final report. Additionally, both programs feature clear scoring rubrics that will include specific scoring criteria and directions for panelists. The new rubrics are also aligned with the city's strategic direction 2023 and the Arts Commission Four Pillars. And finally, but most notably, both Nexus and Thrive center the role of community relationships over monetary resources. This means that both programs will prioritize the involvement of community at various cross sections in the planning process and in leadership over an applicant's existing access to financial resources like cast matches, which are no longer required. This will emphasize the importance of community voice and representation through both Nexus and Thrive. Um, next slide. Um, I'm Kamiko, by the way, and I'm also a cultural funding specialist. Um, so I'm going to share an overview with ne of Nexus with you. This program supports creative public programming that is developed through collaboration between artists and community-based entities. Such entities include, but are not limited to, culturally specific groups, groups representing LGBTQ and disability communities, nonprofits, affordable housing developments, and similar. Applications submitted by collaborators are prioritized, but applic individual applicants doing community-centered work may apply. Nexus intends to grow the creative economy by prioritizing applicants who are new to city funding, particularly those who have been historically underrepresented in the city's cultural funding programs. Specifically, Black and African-American, Native American, Asian, Hispanic and Latino, Middle Eastern, Pacific Islander, LGBTQ and disability community members. Next slide. We encourage everyone to read the full guidelines that will be available on our website tomorrow morning. Um, these are a draft. And if you have any feedback or questions on what you read, there will also be a, feedboard, a feedback form linked directly under the guidelines where you can submit your comments and questions. Staff will revise the guidelines as needed before publishing the final version, which we anticipate having available in late September. Much of what's in the guidelines will be familiar if you are a previous community initiatives applicant, but each section has been updated to best reflect current practices and policies. So be sure to revisit each section, even if you are a prior applicant. So what's in the guidelines? 
general program information, as well as how it aligns with the funding source and the city's commitments. Detailed information on exactly what expenses and activities are eligible. What is required of the applicant once they've been awarded funds, and those are insurance requirements, marketing requirements, and reporting requirements. Detailed information on who is eligible, broken down by applicant type, residency requirements, funding history, and other criteria. An outline of when the program will launch, application deadlines and award announcements, details on where to submit the application, where you can find application assistance, and information on how applications are reviewed. The scoring rubric can also be found in the guidelines, and I will review that in a little bit. You will also find a list of key resources in the guidelines. Next slide. So let's review some of what will be familiar and some of what's changed. What's familiar? This, pro uh, this program is modeled after community initiatives with focused improvement on equity priorities and encouraging community collaboration. Nexus still funds community-centered pro uh, creative projects. There is a flat award amount. The highest scoring applications will receive the full $5,000 award until we run out of money to disperse. The application will be open to individuals, organizations, and other groups. Fiscal sponsorship remains optional. We are still encouraging and prioritizing new applicants. We will continue with the payment schedule of 75% upon entering contract and 25% after approval of the final report. Nexus will have a fast decision timeline due to a simplified application and internal staff review. So what's new? The rubric is based on the most recent community initiatives rubric, but places stronger emphasis on representation, collaboration, and community voice. The primary applicant and any collaborators need to meet all eligibility criteria. Individual applicants doing community-centered work may also apply. Nexus is an annual program that will have two applications per year, opposed to four deadlines that we had in community initiatives. This year, the application deadlines will be February 1st and August 2nd. We anticipate awarding 100 applications at each of those two deadlines. Because Nexus follows the city's fiscal year, not the calendar year, there is only one application in fiscal year 2022, but there will be two applications in the calendar year 2022. Next, the $5,000 award amount is an increase from the $3,000 in previous community initiatives years. The increased award amount accounts for insurance costs and ADA services, um, that's accessibility disability services. There is no separate ADA supplement. Instead, costs incurred for providing ADA services is considered in the application scoring. Nexus does not have a matching requirement. And this change was made to reduce the burden on recipients, especially in the current economic crisis. Applicants must have an operating budget of under $250,000, and that is intended to mitigate the geographic expansion of eligible applicants, and it's meant to ensure that the program can continue to serve emerging talent and small organizations. Applications will be reviewed and scored by an internal panel of staff from cultural funding and a staff member from the African American Cultural Heritage Facility. We hope to add one to two community members to the panel in the near future. I'm going to pass it over to Penny for a minute for our next interactive question. Thank you, Kamiko. Our next question is, what is the minimum award amount for Nexus projects that would allow an applicant to make something meaningful? Possible responses are lower than $3,000, $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, $6,000, or I'm not sure. Please take a few moments to add your responses to menti.com. Mm 
will allow just a few more moments for anyone that has not already added their response. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your answers. I will now hand it back over to Kamiko to continue our presentation. So now the rubric. The rubric is critical as it determines your score, which then determines which applications get funded. The top scoring 100 applications will receive funding, and there is no minimum number of points. The first section is the eligibility screening. Each criteria screens whether the application is eligible or ineligible, and you must satisfy all eligibility criteria in order to proceed to the application. The next two sections are scored. General application questions are scored by staff, and deeper questions that demonstrate cultural and social impact are scored by the internal panel. Each scored criteria is aligned with Austin's Strategic Direction 2023 and the Arts Commission's four pillars, and points are weighted to reflect our funding priorities. The rubric is designed to be a learning tool that can support all applicants in making their best application possible. It's meant to reduce subjectivity and ensure consistency in how each application is scored. We encourage all applicants to test their proposal against the rubric before submitting their application. Each criteria will have a corresponding question in the application, and you can find on the rubric an explanation of what qualifies for full points, what is approaching proficiency, and what is considered insufficient. We'll be hosting a guided discussion on Nexus later this month, and we'll share that information in the chat and at the end of the presentation. And back to Penny for our next question. Thank you, Kamiko. Our next question is, based on what you have just heard, what questions do you have about Nexus? Your feedback is very important. We will use the questions posted here to help inform the structure for the guided discussion on Nexus happening on August 26th. More information about attending the guided discussion on Nexus will be available at the end of this presentation. We'll allow a little bit more time to allow you to input your answers. We're going to allow just a little bit of extra time on this question to allow everyone to um, input their response. Okay, we have about 10 more seconds.
All right, thank you everyone for inputting your answers and responses. I will now turn it over to Anne-Marie McCaskill-Davis to continue our presentation. Thank you, Penny. I am Anne-Marie McCaskill-Davis. I'm a cultural funding specialist senior with the Cultural Arts Division. So let's jump right into our overview of the Thrive Pilot Program. Thrive is for nonprofit arts organizations. Um, we are intending to allocate a total of two and a half million dollars for this program. We are planning to have this program have a two year contract term and we anticipate approximately 25 to 45 contracts will be awarded. Request, request amounts will be between $30,000 and $80,000 per year. This program will make Austin's diverse cultures more widely accessible to tourists by strategically prioritizing support for, for the program's operations and leadership development of small to mid-sized Black, African American, Native American, Asian, Hispanic, Latino, Middle Eastern, and Pacific Islander-led arts and cultural organizations that are significant contributors to the city's creative vibrancy and heritage. Next slide. Remember, the guidelines are a draft. I do not see the presentation up. Oh. Okay, Thrive, what is in the guidelines? Okay, the structure of the guidelines is very similar to what's in Nexus, um, but the information will be specific to Thrive. Um, so again, you'll find detailed information on exactly what the program funds, including eligible and ineligible expenses and activities. Who can apply provides detailed information on eligible applicants. Um, contractual obligations covers what is required of the applicant once they have been awarded funds. And again, that also includes insurance, marketing requirements, and reporting requirements. Funding availability and timeline provides a detailed outline of the application deadlines and award announcements. Um, and how to apply gives you some direction there on submitting the application and finding support. And there is an appendix that includes glossary and resources. Um, and those guidelines will be available um, tomorrow. We expect to have those live on the website along with the link to where you can provide your feedback on those guidelines. And I don't see Anne-Marie back yet, so I'll just keep going. So what is familiar with Thrive? So Thrive's guidelines build on the framework of eligible expenses from the former core organizational support program, but with notable flexibility, which will be outlined in the what's new section in the guidelines. Um, there will be a panel review and scoring process with noted improvements in panelist training and instruction based on community feedback. If you would like to provide feedback on the panel review process, I encourage you to attend the guided discussion, which is scheduled for this Thursday, August 12th at 6 p.m. And we'll share information about that in the chat after I'm done with this section. What is new? Most of this program is new. Conceptually, this program is an important new step for the city's cultural funding priorities as it is meaningful investment in arts organizations that are led by and representing Austin's diverse cultural communities. 
Funding can be used for the improvement and growth of arts organizations as it relates to their ability to produce public events marketed to Austin's tourists. This is in keeping with the use of funding for improvement as it relates to funded arts organizations per the hotel occupancy tax, tax statute, the encouragement, promotion, improvement, and application of the arts. Unlike, unlike past core funding requirements, Drive request amounts and award amounts will not be limited by organizational budget. Next slide. Here are some other new elements in Thrive. Thrive is open to Austin arts nonprofits only and fiscal sponsorship is not allowed in this program. This program is not open to individual artists or incorporated groups. Applicants must be a 501c organization and have been in operation in the Austin metro area for at least five years to be eligible. There is no matching requirement. Thrive contractors will be issued a two-year contract guaranteeing the same award amount in year two, creating stability and reducing burdensome reapplication requirements. At the end of the first year of the contract, there will be an interim report, which once completed will allow for the full disbursement of the final 10% of the first year's funds. The payment schedule has been restructured so that 90% of the award amount will be issued at the time of entering into contract. And the final 10% will be issued once the interim report, or if in the second year, the final report has been reviewed and approved. Thrive will have one or more cohorts, depending on the number of awarded contracts. We envision the cohort being a shared opportunity for networking, learning, and support for all of the awarded contractors. Non-monetary capacity and organizational improvement resources such as coaching, networking, industry resources, training, and professional development workshops will also be offered to awarded organizations and will be partially self-determined based on the contractor's needs and goals in partnership with the CAD staff. Um, and we have a Penny question next. Thank you, Kamiko. Our next question for Menti is, what is the minimum award amount for Thrive contracts that would allow an applicant to meaningfully improve their organization? With current funding available, oh, I apologize. My computer just froze just a second. There it goes. I apologize. It's back up. I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, with current funding available, we plan on having $80,000 maximum award each year per two-year contract. Possible responses are lower than $30,000, $30,000, $50,000, higher than $80,000, or I'm not sure. We'll allow a few more moments for your responses. Thank you everyone for your responses. We'll allow about 10 more seconds. I will now pass it back to Kamiko to continue our presentation. Okay, and Anne-Marie, you can pop on video if you wanna take this back over, but I'm happy to continue. Okay. Yeah, I'll try. Sorry about that, got bounced off. Um, so although this walkthrough does not give us time to go into the details of the entire scoring rubric, we did wanna take some time to share information 
about how to read it and some important notes about how scoring will reflect the priorities of Thrive. You will notice that there are three primary sections of the rubric, an eligibility screening, a general section that is scored by staff, and a social and cultural impact section that will be scored by the panel. Eligibility criteria are direct does or does not qualify, and the application, general application section is a simple objective scoring system based on the applicant's equity priorities where scores will be fully determined by the applicant organization's information. The social and cultural impact section includes priorities that panelists will score based on applicant responses to key questions within the application. The highest scoring applications will be funded. The score an applicant receives will also be a factor in determining award amounts. Award amounts will not be limited to the applicant's budget, um, organization's budget. Some important notes. You will notice the scores are weighted to directly reflect Thrive's programmatic and equity priorities. Clear scoring examples are provided for each category of the rubric, and this information is designed to aid applicants and panelists and ensuring the program's priorities are fully realized. Like Nexus, the rubric is purposefully clear and transparent to create a more approachable application process so that unnecessary applicants will have the opportunity to see clear areas for improvement should they decide to reapply. If you want to learn more about Thrive, read the full guidelines and the rubric at our website, which will be posted in the morning. At the end of this presentation, you will be provided with details on upcoming guided discussions on Thrive. We encourage everyone to share their feedback with us during the Thrive guided discussion scheduled for 6 p.m. on Thursday, August 19th on our feedback survey on our website or consider joining us for the regular virtual open office hours at 10 a.m. on Tuesdays this month to share your questions and thoughts about the program. Penny, please share out our next mentee question. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Our next question is, based on what you've just heard, what questions do you have about Thrive? Again, your feedback is very important. We will use the questions posted here to help inform our structure for the guided discussion on Thrive happening on August 19th. More information about attending the guided discussion on Thrive will be available at the end of this presentation. We'll allow a few extra minutes, sorry, a few extra seconds of time to allow you to input your questions. We'll allow about 15 more seconds and then we'll continue with the presentation. Thank you for your answers. I will now pass it over to Jesus Pantel to continue the presentation. Thanks, Penny. I'm Jesus Pantel, the Cultural Funding Supervisor. The Economic Development Department is exploring the possible use of a third party administrator for the application and or the contracting process. Now, the contracting process itself will remain unchanged as all of the various attachments are either city or state requirements. 
regardless of who administers the contract. But this could free up cultural funding staff time for more community outreach and technical assistance. Plus a third party administrator could also possibly speed up the payment process. Now the third party administrator would be paid with hotel occupancy tax funds. The third party administrator utilized earlier for economic development department recovery grants was paid 5% of the available funds. Since Nexus and Thrive have more detailed requirements than what was needed for the recovery grants, that fee could go up to 10% of the available hotel occupancy tax funds. Since $3 million will be available in FY22, that would be a fee of between $150,000 to $300,000. This third party administrative fee would be on top of the amount already taken out of the hotel occupancy tax funds to cover cultural funding staff salaries. If you have questions or comments about the third party administration, Please be sure to attend virtual open office hours, one of the guided discussions, or to fill out the feedback survey. I'll have links and more information about those in just a bit. And can we go to the next slide, please? So we are taking feedback on these pilot programs through the end of August. We'll spend the month of September analyzing the feedback. And depending on the feedback, we receive the tentative, and I wanna um, state again that this is a tentative timeline, is to open up Thrive applications on Monday, October 4th, with applications due by 11.59 p.m. on Monday, November 22nd. Thrive activities will then start in January of 2022. After that, the Nexus applications will be open with an application due date of Tuesday, February 1st for activities occurring between April 1st through September 30th, 2022. If you have any questions about this timeline, again, you can send your questions to us through the feedback survey or attend one of the virtual open office hours. Next slide, please. So we realize that what cultural funding can offer this year is not enough to serve everyone. But there are several other resources available through the division and the department to support creatives through economic recovery. You may have received funding from some of these already, or they may offer opportunities in the future. I'm not going to read everything that's on the slide since this PowerPoint presentation will be available later, but there are a number of resources listed here. And the Economic Development Department has a list of relief funding for artists at bit.ly, slash musician underscore artist underscore resources. Uh, please note that as has been mentioned earlier, Bitly links are case sensitive and everything is lowercase um, in this Bitly link here, uh, which should be going out in the chat soon if it is not all there already. So Bitly slash musician underscore artist underscore resources. Next slide, please. There we go. So uh, this graphic illustrates who is involved in our decision-making process. At this stage, we are consulting with our reviewers, which includes you. And we have several ways you can share your feedback with us as we embark on the final revisions in this process. Participating in this workshop was one of them. We also have virtual open office hours scheduled that I'll share with you in a moment. You can also leave your feedback in the survey that is linked to on our website with the program guidelines. And if you're more comfortable speaking with staff one-on-one, -on -one, you're welcome to email or meet with your contract administrator. The comment box that some of you are familiar with is still open, but we, re we request that you submit your program feedback through the feedback survey. We will share out project updates via our website, newsletter, social media, and Arts Commission meetings. Next slide, please. We're holding virtual open office hours every Tuesday this month, starting tomorrow from 10 a.m. to noon. No need to RSVP, you can just show up anytime between 10 to noon and an available cultural funding staff member will speak with you. Additionally, we'll have guided discussions where we talk more in depth about specific topics. These will be on Thursday evenings from 6 to 7 p.m. and will be recorded. The first is this week on August 12th and we will discuss peer review panels. On August 19th, we'll discuss Thrive in depth and on August 26th, we'll discuss Nexus. All virtual open office hours, both the Tuesday ones and the guided discussions on Thursdays will all be at the same Zoom link, bit.ly slash E-D-D-V-O-O-H. Um, and that link is also listed on the last slide of this presentation. And again, bit.ly links are case sensitive. So please note that E-D-D-V-O-O-H is all capitalized letters uh, for the virtual open office hours link. Um, next slide, please. 
So that is our presentation on the Nexus and Thrive pilot programs. As far as next steps, please be sure to fill out the feedback survey with any comments or questions you may have. You can also go to our website for more information on the cultural funding review to date, including this PowerPoint presentation. And for more of a one-on-one -on -one discussion with cultural funding staff, again, you can attend a Tuesday virtual open office hours and or one of the Thursday guided discussions for more in-depth discussion on particular topics. You can also email your contract administrator or me with questions and comments. You can see the Bitly links here on this slide, as well as my email address, and a reminder once more that the Bitly links are case sensitive. Now I'll turn it over to Megan for closing thoughts. Thank you, Jesus. Again, thank you to everyone for joining us both tonight and more broadly over the past two years and into the future. We value your questions, thoughts, suggestions, and hope that you will stay engaged with us. We appreciate all of your creative passion, hard work, and service. Please stay safe and well. Good night.